All right, good, fantastic. Okay, so um, again, the purpose of this, my name is Stephen, if you haven't met me, uh, thanks, Tim. And um, uh, a quick introduction, I have been studying Salesforce since November of last year. Um, I like to dive deep when I study something. I started, uh, my first study group was back in May, and it was when I went through uh, a group called Maravis. And some of you may know of it, some of you may not. Um, and I have taken the cell, I have failed Salesforce admin three times. I passed it on my fourth time. And so I am fairly um, well versed on what's on the test, I should say. And um, now I've actually, um, I've built, um, I currently have, I think, five DevOrgs. And I have a different purpose for each one of those. And we're about to talk about those. Now, the purpose of this study group, it's our study group. Feel free to ask a question. Interrupt at any point in time, ask a question. At the end of these, I don't want you leaving going, wait, what about this? Oh, wait, Stephen said something wrong. I'm not right 100% of the time. I may say something wrong. I want you to correct me. Okay, if you believe I said something wrong, correct me. Say, hey, Stephen, that's not right, you know, but bring up the evidence. Let's pull up the evidence because, you know, Salesforce changes on a regular basis. I always like to go to help.salesforce.com, okay? Sometimes developer.salesforce.com. Any resource we have, well, let's go ahead and share it. But with that being said, um, this is the website that you go to, to sign up for your own dev org. If you have not done it yet, and I'll be posting the slides after the class on study Salesforce with Steven. And um, that's the only place where I post those slides. And then um, I may start actually sharing them uh, um, on my LinkedIn page as well. But if you haven't set up a dev org, this is important. Don't wait until after you become certified. Set it up now. Start working on it now. Two important things I could tell you that I wish I did before. And I know that there's other people. Larry could probably agree with me on this. Um, I wish that as I started studying, I opened up a dev work, one. And two, I set up my LinkedIn. If you haven't set up your LinkedIn, I highly suggest you set up your LinkedIn and you get your LinkedIn and you start networking immediately because that is going to give you huge leaps and bounds. Um, today, just today, and this giving you an example of the power of LinkedIn. Um, I let me, I have my other laptop right here. I just received from a recruiter. I did not reach out for this. I just received from a recruiter. Um, uh, and this is not, un unfortunately, it's an on site position. I'm not looking for on site, I'm looking for remote. Okay, this position provides a rare retention bonus of $30,000 up front. Needs, uh, uh, needs to work there for at least three years or you'll have to pay it back. Um, you'll get the $30,000 after the first 30 days. Um, and then after that, uh, you get an automatic $15,000 raise. You'll also receive a $20,000 stock option vested after um, uh, a total of four years, right? And then it lists all this huge list of perks. It doesn't even talk about that the salary yet. Obviously, that's negotiable whenever it goes in there. But I almost guarantee you that salary is going to be about $120,000, if not more. You know, um, and then they said that to me. I did not ask them for that. That's the power of LinkedIn. Okay. Um, so you need to get that set up. You need to go start networking right now. That's extremely important. So enough said about that. These are our topics, configuration setup. I'm not going to go into detail about these. I'm pretty sure we've seen these many, many, many times. And you've probably gone through many of these. Okay. Um, again, I'll say this, my resources are definitely help.salesforce.com, also developer.salesforce.com. I also like using focus on the force. That's a huge, I like using that one too. Sometimes though, um, they just recently have done an update just a couple of months ago, right? Um, but don't count on those. 
don't fall in the trap when you're using focus on the force of memorizing those answers um, when you're using that as a practice test because focus on the force the whole point of that is to give you the design of what those questions can be like right they do help a lot they help out tremendously but we'll talk a little bit more about those later um, when we uh, have some time for questions and answers about question, about the way the question designs are. Okay, so now when we're talking about configuration and setup, so we have this broken down and I'm going to just highlight a couple of these right now. So for instance, describe the information found in company settings. We're gonna talk about the company settings today. Company settings can be very confusing. Okay, they seem to be straight out. What is very common that we get company settings confused with? Anybody? At least this is what I got confused with. And actually after talking to a few other people, and this is something that you easily get them confused with. Go ahead. Company information. Um, company information. Okay, let's go, um, let's go a little bit further than that too. But yes, you're right, definitely. Work settings. Okay, um, there's, there's a specific word I'm looking for. How about locale? Okay. Yeah, is there a difference between the company settings and the default locale? Yes. Yes, there is. And yes, even with company information, yes. you And between those three, between those three, I have gotten many questions wrong. And I'm like, oh, man. But hopefully after today, you'll be able to see there are some unique differences. There are some unique differences, okay? And because there are some things the user can override. There are some things that are in company settings that are not in the default locale. And so there's something that we're going to use to distinguish the difference of those, right? Okay, so then in this next one right here, um, something I want to highlight right here when we take a look um, to distinguish and understand the administrative of declarative configuration of the user interface. Okay, so when we take a look at the user interface, there's a couple of things I want to highlight here. For instance, our app menu. Okay. What do we easily get confused when it comes to our app menu? There's a few things that we get confused with when it comes to our app menu. Even when it comes to uh, anybody. What about, what's the difference between our app menu and our app manager? I mean, we need to know the difference between those two because there's a significant difference because there is a big difference. What's the app manager do? So the app manager, so we see this with our Lightning App Builder. What does the Lightning App Builder do? Go ahead, Larry. Uh, building apps. Okay, what's our App Manager do? It's where you can create it as well. Yeah, exactly, that's where we can create it. But what's our App Menu do? App Menu helps you to uh, do such things like uh, reprioritizing the order of the apps and then yeah so it helps us exactly that right and then when we want to change our apps you remember that little rainbow button that's our app menu and then so that's when we go we get things confused so easily because the way salesforce has named things and these are things that we want to so also to elaborate tuesdays um and this is why i have things separated between tuesdays and thursdays a lot of times in study groups, we stick to slides. We try to stick to information. So I have found it to be very important on Tuesdays, we're giving us the why. What are we doing, right? 
preparing us for the test. Thursdays is the how. So Thursdays, we're going to get into the dev work. I'm going to open the dev work. We're going to look at these settings because um, on the when I pass the exam, then there is actually a lot more questions. And Larry can confirm this. There are a lot more questions in there about the how now. And so let me ask everybody this. When it comes to, um, and you don't have to tell me if you don't want to, has anybody attempted to take the exam? Has anybody seen, you know, uh, um, so Bruce, okay, good. So, um, so you've seen some of those questions um, on that exam, right? So have you ever thought to yourself on, hey, why do they ask us questions like this? How come they don't, Jack? Go ahead. No, I was going to say is um, their style of asking the question is um, there might be more than one answer that's correct, but it's the one that's actually just the most, um, I'm trying to think of the best way of saying it. It's the most correct. The best. Yeah, the most yeah. correct, I guess. Like there can yeah. be ones that's correct, but then the one that's the most correct that actually changes the whole outcome. Yeah, exactly. And, and you're 100% right. Definitely. Um, and then, but so let's say, for instance, um, I'm in the process of getting my complete Microsoft certification. And then um, I'm also going to, after that, move to HTML, CSS, JavaScript, so on and so forth. When you take those certifications, right, they give you a time limit and they give you scenarios. And then you're sitting there pointing and clicking and you're writing code and you're doing all this stuff, right? How come Salesforce doesn't give us an exam like that? They give us a scenario. And then how come they don't tell us exactly how to do that? Why? Does anybody know? Let me ask another question. Maybe this will help with that understanding. Are you ever going to be the boss as an admin? You may be a supervisor. You may have other admins under you. But someone else has purchased Salesforce. And they're paying you because you're the subject matter expert. And they're the ones telling you, saying, hey, okay, I don't want to have to point and click and update every single box every time I want to do this or every time I need to do this. Matter of fact, you know, every time that someone gets a certification, I want to be able to know um, uh, what they got certified in, what day they got certified in. And I want it to be automatically populated in the box, right? I don't want to have to point and click on that. Can you do that for me? I mean, is that possible in Salesforce? Yeah, that is possible. So we need to know exactly, and they're not going to tell us to say, hey, so what I want you to do is to be able to set up a flow to email the person so when they say, hey, um, uh, I got, uh, I'm, I'm certified. Okay, cool. Click one button, certified. It automatically sends them an email. They click on that. It opens up a form. They fill out all the appropriate information. That form automatically updates everything in your system, right? But that's what a flow does, right? So you have to set up two flows. So that way you don't have to go ahead and say, okay, um, hey, what's this person's email? Okay, go ahead and send this person an email. Okay, they gave me this information. All right, let's go ahead and copy and paste and so on and so forth. No. So you just go ahead and click one button and then all of a sudden it's all done. And it's all on the client or the customer to go ahead and do all that stuff and automatically updates in Salesforce. But you set that up through a flow, right? That's why the exam is set up in this way. So that way we can translate what they're saying into what Salesforce can do. So, okay, that was my little rabbit trail right there. My apologies. All right. Um, okay, so right now, today, we're really going to be taking a look at um, some of this information right here. Um, and then we're going to go into a little bit more on uh, configuration setup, a little bit more of this information down later. So with that being said, let's continue going down further. Company settings. So with our company settings, um, we have here within uh, our company settings, 
Um, as we take a look at this, our first one, when it comes to our name and address and um, right here, again, it's billing and support. Primary contact, billing and support. Now, what do we see here that's under company settings? That's that one that we get confused with. What do we have here? The default locale. That's that one. And sometimes in like uh, what you said, Bruce, company information. So company information, and sometimes you can hear company information instead of company settings, but they are the same thing. Okay. Um, our default currency. Okay, so let's take a look uh, a little bit more into this, even our storage and license available. So when we talk about our um, default locale, we're talking about default locale a little bit more. Um, let's talk about our um, currencies, right? What's some more information about currencies do we need to know? Can we have more than one currency? Yes. What do we need to do to have more than one currency? Set up an exchange rate. Okay, definitely. We, we definitely need to set up an exchange rate. There's something else. What, what do we need to make sure that's enabled? Multiple, I forget what it's called, multiple currency. Yes, it, that's exactly what it's called, multiple currencies. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And that is something to where we go in there, and we're, we're going to take a look at this on Thursday. You go in there, you set up multiple currencies right? And then um, now, this is something else that's important. Um, Tim said something about having setting up exchange rates, right? Okay, why do we want to set up exchange rates? What's the purpose of setting up exchange rates? So we can um, exchange the values into the uh, default um, currency. Okay. A dollar if we're in the U.S., you know, we could do sales and potential sales and everything would be listed in the dollar. Excellent. Okay. And, and then that's if, that's if our org is actually using the dollar as the default currency, right? Because if our org is using it as the dollar as a default currency, then um, we may be using... Uh, because what if the orgs are in England and they're using pounds, right? But then they have a, um, a, a division of the company out in the United States. So let's ask this, okay? So if we have our default locale, is currency also under default locale? I thought that it was. It is. Yeah, okay. It is under default locale. So if we have company settings, a default currency, and then under default locale, there's currency. Trick question here. Which one can the user change? The user. I would guess the default currency. The user can change the default locale. Oh, okay. Or in the current, and you're you're right by saying that, uh, uh, Tim is uh, we'd say the, the the default locale currency, because uh, and, and I should be a little bit more specific so we don't get uh, too confused on that. So when it comes to the default locale, the user can override those settings. Okay, and there's a reason why. There's a reason why, because what scenario did I just give you? Right, that would make sense that if it's a, it's a UK based org. Um, or let's has, say that, let's say the headquarters is in Germany. Yeah. Right. And then they have a company, uh, uh, um, a subdivision over in America, right? So now we want, the language is gonna be in what? German, right? but the company in America is gonna be in English. But also, right. isn't there a different English in the UK? Yes. Yeah, they have different spelling. Their grammar is a little different. Um, by default, I, I teach English as a second language. You know, So yeah, there is definitely a different form of English, right? 
They have different spellings, grammar is slightly different, so on and so forth. So yes, there is, you know. Um, so yes, the default locale can be changed by the user, okay? Remember, when we're talking about differences, this is something big Salesforce likes to do. Salesforce likes to know what something can't do and what's something different. So even when you go to help.salesforce.com and developer.salesforce.com, and if you notice as you go through your trailhead, they want to know, those are the big things they're going to ask you questions about, right? You know, and um, those are big things right there that they're going to ask you. What it can't do, okay? Um, what are its limitations? Um, what's difference, What's the difference between the two? Um, for instance, and I believe this is on the next slide right here, um, we're going to talk about, so we talked a little bit about currency, we'll look at that. Um, um, I believe this is also on the next slide, I'm going through some of my notes here. Licenses, what's the important thing about licenses? Where can we see, there are a few different places that we could see available licenses. When we're setting up users, I um, So we have company information. Yep. Okay. And the, yeah, definitely when you're setting up users, you're going to be able to see that you have licenses there. Um, yeah. And then, um, but, um, okay, so let me let me rephrase the question here too. So you have company information, you're setting up users here. So then um, let, let's let's change the angle of that, what we're going here. And then because we're going to revisit this also in a, a later class as well too. So um, now uh, Larry, yeah, he's going to go ahead and um, go work for another uh, company. He actually got a job over at Salesforce.com, and he's leaving Salesforce, Stephen. Right? Okay. So when Larry leaves Salesforce Stephen um, and I'm the admin, what do I want to make sure I do with Larry's account? You're going to disable it. Okay, so I want to disable it. Okay, so now I can't disable it because he is part of some kind of process. Ah, uh, okay. So now what do I do? I need to freeze it. This is going to be a question. I almost guarantee you. I almost guarantee you this is a question on the exam. You freeze the account. And then so you deactivate the account. So you have you have a couple options. There you go. Um, and uh, Aram said, um, and my apologies if I mispronounced your name. Okay, and excellent. There you go, right there in the comments. He said, freeze, then reassign um, roles and then uh, approval to another user. Exactly. So you're gonna freeze, reassign them. Now, let's say, that you don't have anybody to reassign them to. And because why is it important that you reassign um, um, any process, whether it's approval process, because remember we say process, because processes include flows, assignment rules, escalation rules. Um, I mean, the processes include all kinds of things, right? So it's not, so when you hear processes, it's just not process builder, it's processes that includes a lot of things, okay? So um, any kind of process, so you have no one to assign them to, but what is his account holding up that we need that's being paid for and that's not being used? Talking about the licenses? Exactly. And those licenses are paid for. Right. And so that's money being wasted. Now your boss is coming up to you, the owner. Right. And he's coming up to you, Bruce, and he's saying, hey, what's going on, man? You know, 
I'm paying for this license. You know, we need to get that license reassigned to another user. And then you're like, yeah, but Larry, Larry has, you know, um, all this, he's assigned to these processes and I haven't been given anyone to be reassigned to. Who should they be assigned to by default? So you can free up that license and you're the admin. You. So if you have not been given anybody to reassign those um, processes to, the admin by default gets those. So that way you can free up those licenses. Now, as a proactive admin, you're gonna be here like, hey, Larry gave us two weeks. In five days, even though he gave two weeks, I want to know who I need to reassign his stuff to within five days. So then I have five days to work on redoing my flows, redoing, you know, my escalation rules, redoing all this stuff, because it may take you a little bit more time because Larry was a vice president, right? Or Larry was somewhere higher up where he was involved in a lot of this stuff, right? So it may take you a couple of days to get all this stuff reassigned to a new person, you know? So I'm giving you five days to give me someone to Re, re, replace him and then so I can get that taken care of you know so that way it doesn't come down on you because that's money being uh, I know I know I can't stand that guy because he likes cheesecake and I can't eat, eat cheesecake I love cheesecake man <laughs> okay so that, that's licenses right there right um, so licenses are very important. Um, and there's a few more things I want to cover about this too, but I want to check my next slide right here. Okay. Yes. Okay. Good, good, good. I did have this up here. So, um, I want to go back one, um, because I want to make sure I'm not missing anything. And then, um, a couple of things that I don't have on here. So we went through currencies and I think I did miss this on my slide. Um, Something I did miss on my slide right here is um, let's talk about storage. Something else that's interesting here. So when we talk about storage, right, and um, I know I'm going into a lot of information right here. And um, so what, what counts against your storage? There's kind of a hint kind of have a hint right here. I'm going to change the color of this. Kind of have a hint. Can you rephrase the question? So, okay. So um, when we have our storage, um, so every org is going to have a storage limit. What counts as storage? What is part of your storage? Usually data. Okay, so we have data. Okay, um, data is definitely storage. And then um, there's something else that can, uh, um, because uh, your, your data can actually be the smallest part of your storage, believe it or not. Um, there's something else that can take up your storage a lot quicker than just data. Attachments, yes, exactly. So, because if someone's, uh, if let's say you have um, exactly uploaded files, right? So everything, so let's say you have email to case and um, you have a setting under email to case to where every attachment gets uploaded into your org. And that goes against there. Your recycle, and I may, I may, be, um, I may be misquoting you on this one, um, Larry, you could correct me if I'm wrong here. I believe your recycle bin goes against your, uh, um, uh, your storage. I may be wrong on that one. I know we'll cover that one a little later, you know, um, but data, um, is because those are your records that goes against your storage. And then also content, um, your, uh, pictures, uploaded files, chatter goes against your storage too, as well. Um, so, okay, now let's continue moving on. And then 
we talked about this. We talked about our currencies right there and then our fiscal year, right? So when we're looking at our fiscal, fiscal year, what else do we want to talk about when it comes to our fiscal year? Because we can have essentially two types of fiscal year. We, so what are they? Gregorian. Okay, so we have our Gregorian calendar. Okay, yep. And then in that one would go our, what we would call our standard or our regular fiscal year, right? And, and then custom. And a custom, exactly, right? Okay, so um, what dictates our standard or regular uh, fiscal year? Okay, or let's go ahead and let's go, let's uh, um, reverse engineer this. What tells us what is a custom fiscal year? I'm going to start from your date selection or what? Okay, yeah, there you go. You're going down the right alley. Okay, so, so give me an example of a date selection, Bruce. Uh, if you want something at the beginning of a month, the end of a month, or uh, in the middle, basically. Okay, well, give me, so so. let's say I start it at, um, today's the 13th of September. When's going to be the end date? September 13th of 2022. When's going to be the end date? You said if you put it as the beginning as the 13th, then it'll be the 12th as in. The 12th of what? Uh, September for the following year. Okay, that would be a standard. That would be a standard right. fiscal year, right? Okay, so anything that's going to be 12 months, and it doesn't matter if it's going to be at the beginning of it, it doesn't matter when you set the date, anything that will still be 12 months is a standard. Okay, so, um, and then that was a good example, Bruce. So even at, if you start at the 13th, and it goes through the 12th of the following year, that's still a standard, because it's still 12 months. So it doesn't matter what month, what day, or anything you started on. As long as it's 12 months, that's standard. Now, if you set it for three months, that's custom. If you set it for 13 months, that's custom. Six months or anything outside of that 12 months, that's a custom fiscal year. Now... Something that's important. Remember what I said that Salesforce likes to ask questions about what you can't do or something beyond the normal? Once you enable custom fiscal years, you cannot disable it. You cannot disable it. And so I almost guarantee you every org that you enter that you have not started, custom. Uh, uh, custom fiscal years has probably been enabled, right? Um, and probably every org that you've uh, started at one point in time, you may or may not have enabled it, right? Because you cannot uh, un uh, disable it. So once it's been enabled, and Bruce said this, then the easiest way to set up a standard fiscal year is by using a Gregorian calendar. And there's an option in there. That's the easiest way to set up a fiscal year, you know, um, because other than that, you have other kinds of options, three months, six months, quarterly, semi-annually, uh, things along those lines. Um, but that's the fiscal year there. Um, we talked about uh, licenses. Um, let's see, your currencies. Ah, something I did not mention about currencies. And this one you probably will see and I'm going to have to look this up. I can't remember the, uh, if the, of this off the top of my head. What is important about having, um, and Larry may be able to help, uh, help me remember this. Um, this may be something I have to owe you on uh, uh, Thursday. Um, about when we set up currencies and we set up our um, exchange rates. Date, I, I believe they're called dated exchange rates. What's important about dated exchange rates? Because exchange rates, um, do exchange rates change on a daily basis? Mm 
They yes. do. I don't know if they're updated daily in Salesforce, but they change uh, daily. Yes, they do. And yes, as they say, there's an app for that. And yes, there is an app for that in uh, Salesforce. Okay. So there is an app that you could download um, because sometimes we always try to think uh, as we become more experienced in Salesforce, hey, what can I build? What can I go ahead and go for and do in Salesforce when, hey, just look for an app. You know, I, I got stuck in that loop in a project I was in actually uh, 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 just last month um, that I was like, oh, what can I build? And then one of my teammates, you know, she was really like, hey, let's just look for an app. And they found an app and it was perfect. Um, anyway, there's an app actually to keep all your exchange rates updated. And um, Salesforce uses the uh, something.exe for the exchange rate. But the important part of the data exchange rate. So let's say you just closed um, a $20,000 deal or let's say a $20,000 deal just got closed 12 September, right? And I, let me change that. Let's say it was a 20,000 euro deal. Well, the euro tends to be higher than the dollar, right? But today, the 13th, the euro dropped. Did you just lose money? Well, if you don't have dated exchange rates on, yes, you did. The dated exchange rate sets that exchange rate as when that deal closes, that exchange rate is locked on the date that deal is closed. So you don't lose that money. Something very important to note. That actually may be something that's on the test too. Um, okay. Business hours. Business hours are actually very important. So um, what does it mean when we say, see here that, um, oh, let's see here, uh, um, Bruce asks, can we do configuration and set up as a group and focus on the force like uh, questions, breakdowns? Um, oh, we could definitely do that. Um, once we get through uh, configuration altogether, um, I believe I have it set up in configuration um, and set up as one and two. So once we get through that, uh, that'll be two weeks. Then we, yeah, we could definitely uh, just concentrate on that. Yeah, um, I have no problems with that. Yep. Um, uh, good question. Thank you, Bruce. Um, because configuration and setup is a, such a big portion of it, and there's a lot of information. So, and I do, like I said, I, I do like using focus on the force. And then we can even bring it up, and then um, we could just bust through that too. I like that. Um, good question, Bruce. So, um, and this one is actually very important. And I do believe there was a question on this too. Um, so with business hours, um, these are used when uh, escalation rules um, do their escalating. What does that mean? Okay, so first let's explore what's the purpose of business hours. Let's break this down. Kind of have the hint on the uh, on the page. I know it, it's it, it sounds kind of interesting, but when you really think about it, so I'll break it down this way. So if if um, we're open Monday through um friday let's see let's go up to the chat right here um okay yep um they could definitely prevent access 100 percent. okay monday through friday so we're open up monday through friday okay and from nine to five all right and um let's see here for escalation rules outside of business hours to escalate a case yes noel exactly Right, because do we need to escalate anything outside of nine to five? Definitely. Well, who are we gonna, uh, um, uh, in, okay, uh, okay. Yes and no, yes and no, yes, you're right. Depending upon the situation and the company, okay? 
So that depends upon the situation and the company. Um, and then the reason why I say this, um, and it depends upon how you have things set up, but most of the time, no. But yes, okay, because um, on holidays, who are you going to escalate it to? And again, this depends upon the business. So for instance, um, my brother-in-law, um, he would benefit greatly for uh, having Salesforce. He runs um, an IT business and he actually um, uh, has data centers for healthcare companies. This would benefit him greatly, right? So outside of business hours, if someone's having a power outage or something like this, this would be fantastic for him, right? You know, um, and because, but during business hours, yes, business hours for traditional businesses, then yeah, you're going to have your escalating rules kicking. But when nobody's in the office, right? Do your escalating rules, do you want to be receiving all kinds of emails saying nobody's answering any cases after, if someone has submitted a case um, on Christmas Eve and nobody's answered it within 24 hours, do you want to be receiving an email on Christmas Day saying, hey, nobody's answered this on Christmas Day? And you're like, why am I receiving this email? It's Christmas Day. Right? So on holidays, this actually shows us when your escalation rules aren't going to kick off. Right? And this actually shows us when they are going to kick off. But like Tim said, it depends upon the case. Because you can easily set up your escalation rules depending upon the business. Like, for instance, in my brother-in-law's case, I mean, hospitals run 24-7, right? You know, there could be power outages. There could be many different situations. So um, uh, that's someone who actually works 24-7 in his cases, and he has people on call, you know. And then if someone's not answering the phone, he can have an escalation case, boom, set up to where something's not being answered within a certain time frame. That would benefit him. But traditionally, that's what business hours and holidays also do, right? So it's not just to go ahead and dictate when someone's working and when they're not. It also helps with your processes, okay? Now, um, coming down into default locale, okay? Now we see something a little bit different. So we do see our default currencies our uh, uh, date time formats, number formats. Um, why do we have number formats in here? Some countries do number formats differently. You know, in America, we do our number format like this. Other countries do their number format like this. So some countries do their number formats differently. And um, so that's why number formats are in there. Um, addresses and default currencies. Some countries do their addresses differently. And um, let's see here. Now, again, the user can change all of this information. Does anybody by chance besides Larry know where the user can change this information? So I'll tell you right now, but um, when I tell you um, on a Thursday, I'll be able to show you, okay? And this is something that's gonna be really, really specific. Um, but when you're logged into your org and you go up to the upper right-hand corner, you know, you see that little picture, you know, a lot of times it's, uh, oh man, I forgot the little feller's name, the Salesforce mascot. Larry, do you remember his name? So Astro. Astro, yeah. So most of the time you see a little picture of Astro right up there. You know, if you haven't uploaded your own picture, you click there and you go under, that's where you see settings. That's actually user settings. And that's where the user could go in there and change all this information right there. Now, um, as admins, 
where, where can we change this information for the user? Keywords under user. So when we set up the user or we go under user, that's where we see this information. So that's where we see, you know, uh, their language, you know, um, a lot of this stuff, their address, um, you know, uh, their date time, all this stuff. That's where we see a lot of this for them. And that's where we see this information right here. And we're going to show you this. And believe it or not, when you combine the two of these and you get back into the org and you see exactly where it is, by knowing where this stuff is will actually help you remember the difference. Now, what I want to do here is I want to make sure that we see here the similarities and the difference, okay? Because we have currency. Now, notice this doesn't say anything about them. They could change the default currency, but they can't do anything with exchange rates. They can't do anything else with that. They can only change the default currency for themselves, right? The org still can be using Euro, but for their situation, for their account, they could be using dollars. For um, their time zones, right? Their date fields, they could be using the 24 hour clock or they could be using Eastern Standard Time instead of GMT plus one or um, uh, GMT plus three or whatever it is. So they could be having um, uh, a completely different time zone, you know, or even under language, they can actually be using British English instead of American English or a completely different language. You know, so there are some similarities, but there are a definitely some big differences here. So I want to go back to, I'm going to jump in between two slides here real quick. Okay. So as we can see some similarities, notice there's no fiscal year. Okay. Just the date and time frame. They can't do a fiscal year. Business hours, holidays, not on there. No business hours, holidays. So if you think of just a personal stuff that a user can use, right? If we come back up here to this very first slide right here. Name, address, okay? Currency, nothing about storage, nothing about licenses. Language, yes, they could change language. Currency, yes, they could change currency, okay? Um, date and time, okay, but not fiscal year. Nothing about fiscal year. Nothing about business hours, nothing about holidays. Um, so um, I hope that helps. Any questions? I know we covered a lot of information today. And that's why I broke up uh, uh, um, uh, configuration and setup into two parts, because there is a lot of information. And see, I'm not, I'm not someone who likes to set up um, death by PowerPoint either in and, um, and, and that aspect, because I know a lot of us have um, Salesforce. I like to um, also brief by exception because, excuse me, I said I know a lot of us have Salesforce. I know a lot of us have focus on the force, you know, but um, uh, I, I like to um, also talk about um, what Salesforce can't do, what um, through uh, experiences are on the test, um, and then also getting into the org, applying what we see here and getting our hands on, right? And um, I find um, those, those things there um, help us out a lot. And if you don't understand anything, one of the reasons why I started this was I had a really difficult time. I started studying in November. I didn't pass my Salesforce exam until June. So November of 2021, and I didn't pass my exam until June of 2022. A lot of that was because I was like, I could do it by myself. And that's when I failed three times. 
And it wasn't until I started a group is when I passed, you know? Um, so my goal is trying to make this as easy as I possibly can. Um, hopefully I'm able to do that for you. Does anybody have any questions? Okay, good. Thank you, Noel. Thank you. Um, um, because if I'm making it more difficult, tell me I'm making it more difficult. You know, I'm a very open person. You know, I mean, I know I'm bald, you know, so uh, you could go ahead and talk about it. I, I don't care, you know. Um, and so by all means, tell me if I'm doing something wrong. Um, definitely. Uh, I'm all about it. You know, um, I just want to go ahead and help out. Good. I I'm glad to hear that. Um, thank you very much. And then, so what I'll do is I'm going to, um, the, every session is recorded too, you know? Um, so I will, um, within this session, I will make sure that um, sometimes it takes me a couple of days, but I will be posting it. I always post it to my YouTube and then um, I will be posting the link on LinkedIn and I'll be posting these slides as well, you know? Um, so everybody has these slides and everything too. So, and I try to always keep it and respect everybody's time. So on Thursday, same time, I know some other people have tried joining, they get the uh, um, central standard time a little bit confused, you know, so um, if that's, um, if no, go, go ahead, Bruce. I'm sorry. Um, when you took your test, did you do it, uh, did you do it at the site or did you do it at the home? At home, online. Did I? Okay. Mm -hmm. Just kidding. I've only known one person actually to take it at the site and um uh yeah uh, i've only known one person to take it outside but i took it at home actually kind of a funny story about that is um so the last time i had it scheduled i had it scheduled on a tuesday and i did not realize the week prior my microphone and my speakers quit working and and it was a device error on a device driver. And then I had to um, pay, I think it was 75 or hundred dollars to reschedule the next day. Then I'm completely flipping out. I ended up borrowing another computer for the next day. And so I'm all stressed out. Then I uh, get another computer. I make sure everything's working. And then the next day I'm in the middle of taking it. And then, um, the, I think I was on question 45, and then all of a sudden the, uh, the computer completely freezes out, right? And then the screen pops up in there. Um, I'm talking to customer support, and customer support says, um, hey, it looks like that your internet um, is weak, and the uh, proctor can't hear you or see you or anything. And, you know, I'm like, okay, um, hey, can I grab my phone? and check my internet strength. And they're like, yeah, go ahead. So then I went ahead and checked my internet strength real quick. And I'm like, okay, um, hey, it's showing that it's weak. Can I reset my internet? They were like, yes, after you reset your internet, reboot your computer, come back online. And I'm like, okay, I'm freaking out, right? I'm in the middle of the test. So I go ahead and get all that stuff done. I get back up, everything comes back on. And then thankfully, everything worked out fine. And I'm just freaking out. You know, this is my fourth time taking it, and it comes back up. Thankfully, it was on question like 45, you know, or whatever it was. And then I continue taking it, and I'm like, oh, man, I'm so screwed. And then I clicked that button. And the funny thing is, is and probably Proctor see this all the time, first thing I see, it says, congratulations, you passed. And I just started laughing. And I just started laughing. You know, the Proctor still seeing me, and I laughed. And I was just like, ha, 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 yes. Uh, you know, um, but yeah. Um, so, uh, I'm, I'm a big proponent of taking it home. Now I did clear everything off my desk. You know, I have a green screen right here. So, you know, um, uh, with that, um, let me, uh, let me do this right here and you can see, I just have a, a green screen and, um, the, everything was fine. Yeah. They didn't, they didn't have me move my camera. They didn't check anything, you know, but you're not allowed to use a headset. You have to have your camera and a microphone has to be working. Yep. Good question. Oh, and one thing on top of that, and you're not able to use uh, external monitors either. So ah. for me, I had my whole setup 
um, where I had a nice large, you know, gaming monitor because my eyes are bad. That's why I'm wearing glasses. Uh, and I got this tiny little 10 inch laptop screen. Um, and when it came time to take the test, it, the main, my main screen, the gaming monitor blanked out and then everything popped up on the, uh, the little 10 inch screen laptop. So just, just be, uh, just be wary about, you know, what type of, uh, platform that you're using to, uh, take the test on. So if it's a laptop, uh, be prepared to take it on the laptop. Uh, but if you're using a desktop system, um, you know, just be prepared to take it on your main mod. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. And so it's, it's definitely an interesting experience. And one last thing before um, we got to go, it's already one minute past. I always like to be respectful of everybody's time. If you want to have some special guests, I'll try to get special guests in here. We had it in our last cohort, a couple of them. They were great. We had uh, um, Stephen Trumbull with Flows. I mean, that one, that was fantastic. Uh, I'm much better at Flows than what I was. That was a horrible, horrible class on my first one that I did on Flows. Look at Larry laugh. Oh, man, that was horrible. I'm glad I got him back on the Flows. I'm much better on my Flows. I mean, it was terrible. Every flow I tried doing, I felt that. Every single one, you know, and uh, <laughs> yeah, that was bad. That was bad. I've done a lot more flows since then, you know, um, uh, but I'm pretty confident I'll be able to do a lot better at this time on the flows. I've done much more complicated flows since then. But uh, if you want special guests, we'll see about trying to get some special guests, people who have a lot more experience than I do. I'm definitely Stephen Trumbull back. He did fantastic. Um, and Adam Best. You know, um, he is an architect. Um, but anyway, so thank you very much, everybody. I hope you have a good evening. See everybody later. See you Thursday. Same time. Bye-bye now.